My, that sure does look fun, doesn't it? Hi, it's me, Weird Engine Swap Man. As you might know, I do engine swaps. Chevy engines into Mazdas, Honda engines into Subarus, and even Subaru engines into Subarus. And I do just about all the work myself, including the wiring. Especially the wiring. And knowing how to wire a swap is hands down the most useful skill I have when it comes to swapping. And sure, things like basic fabrication and knowing how mechanical things work helps, but generally the thing that most people get hung up on is the wiring. So, here we are. Now, most swaps require custom wiring harness merges to get them up and running. Many of you have asked how I do my wiring, so I'm gonna try and walk you through the process that I use to get things plumbed up electrically. And to do that, we're gonna need a change of scenery. Okay. Here we are in front of my computer. Most of my wiring happens right here at my desk, not in the car. There are some swaps where I do it all at the car, but even then I plan everything out here at my PC and then go out to the shop and do it all in one go. The RX-8 is a good example of this. Other times I make adapter harnesses right here at my desk. Now things are just easier for me to do at a computer because then I have a nice big monitor in front of me and I can easily flick through different wiring diagrams. Now, in my swaps, there are generally three different harnesses that need to be merged together. Number one is the ECU harness. And this is the harness that comes right out of the ECU. Number two, the car harness. Now, this is what provides us with power and also lets us turn on things like fuel pumps or radiator fans. Number three is the engine harness for things like sensors, injectors, and coils. Now, in order to merge all of these together, we gotta understand the basics. So we'll start with that. This is a light bulb, specifically a check engine light. The ECU turns this light on to let you know when something is wrong, such as when there's a code available to be read. Remember, the ECU is in control of this light. Now, just off screen, these wires go to a normal car battery. The wires are just wrapped around the battery posts. If I pop the red wire onto one side of the bulb and the black wire onto the other, the bulb lights up. And if I remove the black ground wire, it goes out. Now this action right here, me touching and untouching the ground wire from the light, is how the ECU turns the bulb on and off. The ECU has his own grounds that he'll connect the light to when he wants to turn it on. How do I know this? Well, I read the wiring diagram, which is in my car's FSM, or Factory Service Manual. Now you can find this by googling insert your car make and model FSM and by either downloading or purchasing it. This is the wiring diagram for a 99 Subaru Legacy, a car I just recently swapped. I need the check engine light to work so I look at how it's wired. And here we have the engine electrical wiring diagram for this car. So here we have the malfunction indicator lamp, also called the mill, also called the check engine light, also called the cell. Each manufacturer calls it something different, but it's the same thing. Now, if I follow this wire out of the light bulb, we can see that it goes directly to the fuse box. Now, the fuse box is always 12 volts, so this wire has 12 volts in it. If I follow the other side, you can see that it goes right down to the ECU, which means the ECU must ground it to turn it on. It's already got 12 volt from the fuse box, so that's the only way the ECU can turn it on. That much is implied. Now notice how these wires here have a black dot. This means they're connected, as opposed to these wires here where there is no dot. They just happen to cross over each other in the diagram. It means nothing. This is a connector. It shows which wire goes to which pin within said connector. Now our check engine light goes through pin 7. Which pin in the connector is that actually? These here are our connector identifiers, I2 and B37. Remember, a connector is actually in two pieces, two plugs that plug into each other. Now if we go down to the bottom of this page, Subaru helpfully has little pictures of the connector. And this here is I2. And if we zoom in, here is pin 7. But where does this connector actually like physically exist within the body of the car? That would be right here. Remember, B37 plugs into I2. You just gotta find the right page with that connector and you can see where it actually is. This one's behind the dash. We can also take a gander at these letters on each wire in the diagram. 
RG meaning red-green. This is a red wire with a green stripe. And it just so happens to be red-green all the way down to the ECU. And sure enough, if I go look at the wiring in the car at the ECU connector, boom, there it is, red-green. Now how did I know that RG meant red-green? Because there's a page in the wiring diagram that tells us what each color means. For example, BY means black-yellow. However, BRY means brown-yellow. Notice how the R is lowercase. You may also have a single color, such as B, meaning black, or a solid black wire. You could also have LG, meaning light green, or a solid light green wire. Again, the G is lowercase, meaning it's just a single color. But this diagram only shows three pins. When the connector itself has 22, where are the rest of the pins? Those pins are on other pages of the diagram. The diagram only shows pins that are pertinent to the current page. Now you can scroll through to the other pages that have that same I2 B37 connector and see what the pins do if you really want to. But what is this symbol here? That is a ground. The ECU itself grounds out on the engine. Why is that? Well, that's where most of the ECU's action is, right on the engine, usually on the intake manifold. Sensors, injectors, coils, those are all either on or close to the intake manifold. So that's where the ECU typically grounds out at. Now there's also a special ground provided by the ECU itself called the signal ground. This is a separate grounding circuit that is cut off from the rest of the engine and chassis in order to reduce electrical noise that could cause electrical interference in our sensor readings. We need good clean sensor readings from sensors such as this one, the engine coolant temperature sensor. Now this is usually the sensor that the needle on the dash uses, but it's also the one that lets the ECU know the engine's coolant temp. This lets the ECU know when it should turn on the radiator fans and when it's freezing cold out so it can inject a little bit of extra fuel to help the engine start and run on those cold winter days. Kind of like a choke on a carburetor. Now most temperature sensors will have two pins, a signal to the ECU and a ground that specifically goes to that sensor ground. And technically temperature sensors don't have a positive or a negative. You can connect them in any direction. And as you can see, this one indeed has two pins. Now one goes straight through to the ECU, so that's got to be the signal wire, and the other goes to a different pin on the ECU. But you can also see that there are some different things connected to this same wire, including this, the letter B. Now what can that possibly mean? This just means that on one of the previous pages, there's another letter B that we can follow that represents the same wire. And indeed, if I scroll up a few pages, I can see it here, where a number of other things seem to connect to it. Now I want to point something out on this connector specifically. Notice how the wire color changes. Now on one side of the connector, it's black, which makes you think, yeah, of course it's black, it's a signal ground, and grounds are usually black. However, if you look at the other side, it is red-yellow. Never in a million years would you think that red-yellow is a ground, let alone the signal ground. So don't blindly guess what a wire does solely based on its color. You gotta check the diagram. Because remember, despite the wire color, this is still the signal ground. Another thing, what's this little number one here? Well, this just means that on the very next page, there will be another number one that we can follow that is the same wire. And indeed, if we scroll down, we can find it right here, going to whatever else it's doing, I don't know. Okay. There's the basics of wiring diagrams. You can now follow wires in the diagram, figure out what they do, what pins of a connector do, and what wire colors mean what. Now, each manufacturer has their own style of wiring diagrams, but the core concepts still remain the same between all of them. The diagrams are the core of what I use to do my swaps. Mounting and bolting things in is pretty easy, honestly but knowing how to read these diagrams and how to wire things up is what matters most. Now, our goal with doing a swap is to get the engine to run in a car it wasn't meant to be in, but also have most everything remain functional. And there's more to it than just wiring the engine. We also need to get things on the body to run, like the fuel pump and the radiator fans. Sure, you could pull new wiring for each of these, but why would you do that when there's literally better wiring in place ready to be used? We're not barbarians, just read the diagrams. So, now you know how to read a wiring diagram. 
How can we actually apply this? Well, let's start with the core of everything, the ECU. Now, I'm about to drop a pretty hot take on you guys. Standalone ECUs are easier to work with than factory ECUs. Now, that might seem a bit crazy, considering how hard it may seem to wire them in and tune them, but in my humble opinion, they are substantially easier to wire in than factory ECUs. Why is that? It's because they're meant to be. That's like their whole purpose. Now, I personally use Haltech Elite ECUs. I'm not sponsored by them or anything, I've just worked with them for a while, so I am most familiar with them. Now, if you're new to all this, and you're wondering which standalone you should use, the answer is, ask the person who will be tuning your car. They're the ones who are going to have to be using it, so you'll want them to be comfortable with it. And if you're winging it and planning on tuning it yourself, then choosing comes down to what you most prefer. Whenever I first got into all this, I looked for an ECU that had the best software, the best wiring diagram, and the most accessible bass tunes. Now, Haltech ticked all those boxes and still continues to do that. The main thing that drew them to me is that I could download the software right off their website, load up a bass Subaru WRX tune or whatever, and play with it all without having purchased their ECU beforehand. This let me get familiar with their software before making a big investment. Now, that being said, if you hear me say Haltech in this video, you can more than likely interchange that with whatever standalone ECU you want in its stead. I'm just using Haltech as an example. Now, what do I mean when I say standalones are easier to wire in? This is a Haltech wiring diagram. It tells you what each and every wire does. Like this one, that says it's supposed to have switch 12 volt supply from the ignition switch, meaning it would be switched on with the key. Descriptions like that are worth the world because they tell you what the wire actually does. Not only that, once you wire a standalone ECU in one car, you can do it for any swap. In other words, you only gotta learn this once. I'm gonna say this again because I cannot overstate it enough. Once you figure out how to wire a standalone into a single car, you can do it for practically any other swap. It's the same concepts, the same ECU, the same wiring, the same everything. This is how I'm able to simply swap whatever engine I want into whatever chassis without having literally any experience with either. The standalone ECU is the silver bullet. Before the RX-8, I had never touched an LS or an RX-8 in my life. Never worked on either. You just gotta make sure that the ECU supports the engine that you want to run first. Now, how can you do that? Using the Haltech software, just like this. You can just look it up. Now one thing to note is that when I get an ECU, I also get a flying lead harness. Now this is basically a harness that on one end has the ECU connectors, and on the other end is basically wire that you can do anything with. They're usually labeled and have the same colors as the wiring diagram, which really helps things. Then, I wire the car and engine to this flying lead harness. Now, Haltech specifically calls these their basic universal wire-in harness. Okay, so you got your brand shiny new ECU and your flying lead harness. Where do you even start? Well, we start with the wiring diagrams. Before we even start with the physical wiring, we have to get the wiring diagrams up and easily accessible. For this example, I'll be using the swap I just did on my 99 Subaru Legacy, where I got a 10-year newer 6-cylinder Subaru Boxer engine and swapped it into that 99 chassis. And sure, this is a Subaru to Subaru swap, but this is literally the same as any other swap. I followed the same procedure when I swapped the Chevy LS into my Mazda RX-8, and the Honda engine into my Subaru. Now the first thing I need is my ECU's wiring diagram. This is just the diagram for the flying lead or basic universal harness straight off of Haltech's website. Next is the car's wiring diagram. So I grab the 99 Legacy's full wiring diagram. Now remember, this wiring diagram contains literally everything about the car, which includes a ton of stuff that I just don't care about. The radio, headlights, taillights, that should all work regardless of what we're doing with the engine or the ECU. So, what I do is I keep that full diagram around, but search specifically for the engine wiring and bookmark it, or even split those pages out to a separate file, so I can get to the stuff that I care about faster. Now we just need the engine's wiring diagram. Again, I download the full wiring diagram, but grab only the pages for the engine wiring section and split that out, just like before. I shouldn't need anything else from the full diagram because that's for a different car. I only need the engine stuff. And that should be the only diagrams you need. 
And notice, there really isn't all that much here. We got 4 pages for the 99 Legacy wiring, 16 pages for the H6, because it's got a bit more going on with it, and 2 pages for the Haltech wiring. So, 22 pages total. And that's it. Now we just gotta cram them all together. So, we've got our diagrams, we've got our ECU, and we've got our flying lead harness. It's time to actually wire some stuff. But in a sea of hundreds of wires, where do we even start? You start at the basics. And the most basic of things is getting the ECU to power on. And to do that, we're gonna need to talk about relays. Now, as we saw earlier, the ECU grounds the check engine light wire to turn it on. The fuse box provides the 12 volts, and the ECU provides the ground when it wants to. This is what's called low side switching, i.e. we're switching the ground. High side switching would be the opposite, where the bulb is already grounded and the ECU provides the 12 volts. Now, in most cars, nearly everything is low side switched, i.e. the ECU grounds it to turn it on. Injectors, solenoids, even relays, normally low side switched. Now, what role does a relay play? Now, your ECU can obviously switch stuff on and off, but he's a fragile little guy. He can only handle maybe an amp of current, which is enough for a light or a relay or an injector, but things like fuel pumps and radiator fans can take 10 or more amps. So if you tried to switch those with the ECU, not only would it not work, you could actually hurt the ECU. From the ECU's perspective, that's basically a short. Now, modern ECUs and standalones have good internal protection against stuff like that, so it shouldn't fry, but I've seen older factory ECUs that die from something as simple as pulling too many amps from a pin. So we can't very well let the ECU turn on a fuel pump. But what if, instead, we wire the ECU to a magic switch of some sort. So the ECU just flips the switch, and the switch turns on the fuel pump. And that's basically the role a relay plays. And as we can see from the wiring diagram, there are four pins on a typical relay. These are called the coil side, and the other two here are called the contact side. Relays use an electromagnet, aka this coil here, to pull the contact to the on position aka the closed position. Now from this diagram, you can see the coil here. When it's grounded by the ECU, it literally pulls this little bar here to close the circuit. Notice how the circuit is normally open when that little bar is just kind of hanging out there. Now the pump clearly won't run like that, that's not a complete circuit. But when the electromagnet turns on, the little bar gets pulled to the closed position and the fuel pump turns on. And once that contact bar closes, we can follow the power from the fuse box through the relay down to the fuel pump here and then back out to a ground, thus completing the circuit and turning the pump on. So this means that the ECU only has to handle a little bit of current from the coil while the relay handles the large amount of current that the fuel pump needs. And the coil works in the exact same way that the bulb did. One side here has 12 volts from the fuse box, and the other side is grounded by the ECU when he wants to turn it on. The only difference is, instead of it lighting up, it closes that contact bar. In fact, you can even hear a click from the relay when this happens. Okay, so now we know how relays work. Let's talk about how we can power on the ECU, and indeed, everything on the engine. We only want 12 volts to the ECU in the engine when the key is on, right? We don't want anything powered on when the key is off because that would kill our battery. So the key needs to be in control. Now, we can't very well pipe every little bit of current through the key cylinder. That would just fry it, much like our ECU. It can't handle that much current. And what do we do when something can't handle big current? We run that big current through a relay. Now in this Subaru, and indeed most modern cars, there's something called a main engine relay. This is the big boy that turns on the 12 volt power to most everything on the engine. We can actually see this main relay in the diagram right here. It looks a bit different from the fuel pump relay we were looking at earlier. It happens to have two contact bars instead of one, but it's still the same. The coil just closes both of those contact bars, thus completing both of those circuits. Now, those circuits go to most everything on the engine and even some stuff in the car. In fact, you can see that it goes to the ECU itself, meaning this relay provides power to the ECU. Now, we're going to need that because we're replacing the factory ECU with our own. But wait a minute, 
If we follow the coil side, which is the side that actually turns the relay on, one side goes to ground, which means this isn't low side switched like the others. It's high side switched, meaning you give it 12 volts to turn it on instead of grounding it. Remember, I said most everything is low side switched. This is a rare exception to the rule where something is high side switched. No big deal though, because as we know, something that's high side switched is turned on just by giving it 12 volts. So most likely, the key switch is going to give this 12 volts when the key is turned on, right? As stated, we only want the engine stuff to have 12 volts when the key is on, so that just makes sense. And indeed, if we follow this side of the coil, you can see that it goes right to the ECU, not the key. What the shit? Wait a minute. How can the ECU turn that relay on if that relay powers the ECU? That's a chicken before egg situation. The ECU can't turn itself on if it doesn't have any power. That doesn't make any sense. And this, my friends, is where we've got to get creative. Sure, the ECU gets its main power through the main relay, but it also has a separate always on power wire that isn't switched by the key or anything. It always has 12 volts, so in reality, your ECU is always on, but just in a deep sleep power saving mode. And when you turn the key on, it wakes it up from that deep sleep and it turns on the main relay. Why is it like this? No clue, that's just how the factory system works. Now, we could set the Haltech up to do the same thing. In fact, the Haltech has a dedicated pin for turning on the main relay, or the engine control relay. But there's one problem. It's only capable of low side switching. I.e., it can only ground the pin. And the Subaru main relay is high side switched, meaning it's already got a ground and it needs 12 volts to power on. Now, there's a number of ways to get around this and make the Haltech control the relay, but in the end, we just want the main relay to turn on when we turn the key on. So there's got to be a simple way to do that, right? And yeah, there is. Turns out there's a pin that goes to the ECU that provides 12 volts to the ECU when the key turns on, right from the key. No middleman relay, nothing complicated. Just 12 volts when the key comes on. So theoretically, we could just jump the main relay pin to the key 12 volt pin, and the main relay would click on with the key, right? And yes, we could. This is exactly how I wire all my Subarus with standalones. It's just simpler this way. At first, we gotta figure out which two pins on that ECU connector are the ones we're interested in. And buddy, this is a big connector. Now we could look for both pins in the diagram and follow them back to the ECU connector, get the pin number. Well heck, we already know which one is the main relay pin on the ECU, pin 63, because we already traced it out. But Subaru manuals just so happen to have a very handy pinout of the entire ECU. It has a picture of that big ECU connector and a table of pins for what each pin does. So let's reference that. Now here's the main relay pin, or as Subaru calls it, the self shutoff control. Pin 63, as we remember seeing it in the diagram. Oh, and here's the key 12 volt, or the ignition switch pin, pin 85. Now, if we were to jump pin 63 to pin 85, the main relay would turn on with the key. Excellent, that's what we want to do. One problem, how do we actually do that? Like, thus far we've only looked at diagrams. How do we start actually wiring stuff? Now, what you could do is cut the wires off the ECU connector on the harness and twist them together or whatever, but again, we're not barbarians. There's cleaner ways to do this stuff. So here's the way I do it. I grab the factory ECU for this car, I carefully remove the PCB, gently mount it in the vise, and ever so delicately, hacksaw the connector off the PCB. We don't give a shit about the original PCB, we're after that connector. Then, we can straighten out the leads, solder our wires to the back, and bam, we just made our own adapter from Haltech to 99 Subaru Legacy. Now this is the way I've done a bunch of my swaps, and it really helps keep things clean. I actually get everything soldered up here at my desk in front of my nice big computer monitor so I can see all the diagrams clearly and avoid making mistakes. Then, I take it out to the car and test things with a multimeter or whatever. But, be careful with those connector pins. They can be pretty delicate and will snap right off, so avoid stressing them too much. So, with this hacked off ECU connector, we can join those two pins, the 12 volt ignition pin 85 and the main relay pin 63, right together. 
Now the way I do this is I solder a wire to the pin and then put heat shrink over that solder joint. This prevents them from shorting as much as possible. Just don't forget to put heat shrink on the wire before soldering it or else you'll have to unsolder the wire, put the heat shrink on, and then solder it back. It's like flaring brake lines. You always forget the frickin' fitting. Okay, with that out of the way, what's next? Well, we need to get the power to the Haltech. So let's take a look at the Haltech wiring diagram. It looks like there's two pins that need switch 12 volt. Pin 26 and pin 13, both on connector A. Now, if we look at the Subaru ECU pinout, you can see that the ECU gets its power from pins one and two. And actually, the wiring diagram says that pins one and two are in fact the same wire joined together. They probably split it into two pins just to help carry additional current. So we'll just link those two pins together Subaru side, that is at the back of the ECU connector, and also link the two Haltech pins together and solder all four into a single lead. Cool. Now the ECU has 12 volts, it just needs ground. Again, let's go back to that Haltech wiring diagram. So it looks like the Haltech has two grounds here, but they're joined together into one wire coming out of that flying lead harness. So we should just have a single black ground wire. Let's see where the factory ECU gets its grounds from. Whoa, there appears to be six different grounds. But the Haltech only has two ground wires. The main battery ground we just saw, and that signal ground we talked about earlier. Now, right, this may be a little confusing, but don't worry, it is actually pretty simple. The Haltech has the two grounds, main battery ground and signal ground. The Subaru has six grounds. Signal ground, or as Subaru calls it, the sensor ground, and five other grounds here for the injectors, the ignition system, power supply control systems, oxygen sensors. So basically, what we do here is we merge all these grounds together, every single ground, except the sensor ground. He's special. After merging them together, go ahead and connect them to the black battery ground wire coming out of the Haltech. Then connect your sensor ground to the black-white signal ground wire coming out of the Haltech. Quick update. We have the 12 volt lines for the ECU plumbed into the 12 volt in the car. And each of these are grounds and these are just normal solenoid and control system grounds. No sensor ground in here yet, because that's a special one. All of these just need to go to this ECU ground, so I put a little pigtail on there. We'll get them heat shrunk up and then soldered to this. And there we go. Now the Haltech has both its 12 volt and its ground wired up. Your Haltech should now have power, but don't go plugging it into the car just yet. Here's what you can do to make sure that you did everything right and make sure that you don't fry your expensive ECU. In your hands, you'll have an ECU connector with a few wires from the flying lead harness soldered to the back of it. We'll call this thing your ECU adapter. It adapts the ECU to the car after all. So take your ECU adapter, unplug the Haltech from it, and then take it out to the car and hook it up to the ECU plugs in the car. Turn the key on. Now, grab a multimeter and pull up your Haltech wiring diagram. Remember, we wired both pins 13 and 26 to 12 volt on the Haltech connector A. So, we should have 12 volt on both of those pins with the key on. So put your black multimeter lead on the ground somewhere, like the outer ring of a cigarette lighter, put your meter in voltage mode, and then poke the red probe into both pins 13 and 26. You should get battery voltage on both when doing that. Now, we just gotta check your grounds, that is, pins 10 and 11. Make sure your black lead is still grounded, and then put your meter into continuity mode. This is the mode where it beeps when you touch the probes together. Test both pins 10 and 11. They should both beep. Now finally, put the meter back in voltage mode and poke the black probe into pin 10 and the red probe into pin 13. You should get battery voltage. Do the same with the other pins. If it all reads properly, then you did it right. And remember, always lead with your meter. It's your eyes and ears in the electrical world. So as you can see, when you break this down to its bare essentials, it's actually pretty easy. Now you can hook your Haltech up to the ECU connectors, and it should power right up as indicated by the green power light. You should also be able to connect to it with your laptop. And there you go. This is basically what you'll be doing for a fair bit of wiring for the swap. Just soldering the flying lead wires to the back of the ECU connector. I've got just about everything I need wired out of this connector. The ECU power, and the grounds, and the signal ground, and, and things like radiator fans, and the fuel pump. That's all going through here. Now, other things like the injector wires, which we have six, one per cylinder, and the 
coil wires, again six, one per cylinder, I didn't have room for on this connector. And even though there's a lot of pins here, they go to other things that I just don't use anymore, like EGR or the EVAP system. That stuff just isn't in use anymore, so I don't have it pinned out because I don't need it. So that means that these, which are the coils, these are the injectors, and we have a couple things for AVLS or Subaru's version of VTEC. These are gonna need to be done externally. However, I did reuse some things. For example, this car had a four cylinder, so it had four injector wires originally. I ended up reusing those for the electronic throttle body, which needs two position sensors and two motor wires, which totals up to four. So I can reuse it for stuff like that, which just simplifies the wiring a lot. The next thing we can move on to is actually controlling some stuff within the car. Now we started with the check engine light example, so let's just continue from there. First, let's identify which pin controls the cell on the ECU connector using the pinout. Okay, it looks like it is pin 58. Now, if you want to test if it really is, you could just solder a wire to that pin and then ground it somewhere in the car. The light should shine when the key is on and that pin is grounded. Remember, that light is low side switched, so grounding that pin is the same thing as the ECU grounding it. It's a simple way to test things. You could even do this with things like relays, so you could turn your fuel pump on just by grounding its pin. Okay, so now we know that pin 58 is the check engine light. Which pin do we wire that to on the Haltech? There doesn't appear to be a dedicated check engine light in the wiring diagram. So which one do we use? Well, the answer is whichever you want. Kinda. Now this is where I introduce you to the concept of inputs and outputs. An input is a pin on the ECU that senses something on the engine or car, such as that coolant temperature sensor, a manifold pressure sensor, or even a simple button. Those are all sensed by ECU input pins. An output, however, is a pin that makes the engine or car do something. This might be a pin that turns on the fuel pump, turns on a radiator fan, or even controls an injector or ignition coil. Your standalone ECU will come with a set of inputs and outputs. And some standalones allow you to configure what each input and output does, such as the Haltex. Many of its inputs and outputs are configurable, and you can use them for what you please, with some strings attached. So we'll start with the outputs. For the check engine light, you can just choose any output you want, such as any of these DPOs, or digital pulsed outputs. Those are literally there for you to do with what you please. You could use them to turn on the check engine light, turn on the radiator fan, or even use them to turn on some super cool underglow lighting. I don't know. Even this wire that's labeled for the fuel pump relay is technically configurable. That label is just a suggestion. You can use it for whatever you want. Kinda. There are some limitations on what pins can do what. For example, my Haltech Elite 2500 supports DBW, or drive-by-wire. This means it can control an electronic throttle body. However, that throttle body requires some special electrical stuff within the ECU. So it must be wired to the pins labeled for the DBW. You can't just use any old DPO. However, if you're not using a DBW throttle body, you can repurpose these pins for things like lights and pumps and fans. The same rules apply to injector and ignition pins. This 2500 has eight dedicated pins for eight injectors and eight pins for eight ignition coils meaning it can comfortably run an 8-cylinder. But, say you're only running a 4-cylinder. That means you'd have 4 injectors and 4 coils on your engine. But this leaves us with 4 extra injector wires and 4 extra ignition wires. You could actually use those to control whatever you'd like, like pumps and fans and whatever. But, you cannot use any other pin for injectors or ignition coils. For example, you couldn't run a V12 using spare DPOs or something. It's just a limitation of how the ECU works internally. Now thankfully, the software prevents you from making any mistakes like that. We'll go over that a bit more later. And what about inputs? Now, as we stated, an input is used to sense things. Again, we have a dedicated Haltech pin for a map sensor, but that's just a suggestion. You can use it for whatever you want. Let's take a look at a different sensor, the crank position sensor, which is wired through here or as Haltech calls it, the trigger. Now the Haltech has a very special dedicated set of wires for this sensor. You cannot repurpose these for anything. They must be used for the crank sensor. Likewise, nothing else can be used to sense the crank sensor except for these wires. And the same rules actually apply to the cam sensor, or the home sensor as Haltech calls it. It's special. 
But there are other AVIs, or analog voltage inputs, that can be used for whatever you'd like, such as a coolant temperature sensor, manifold pressure sensor, or a throttle position sensor. Each of those typically output a raw voltage, usually between 0 and 5 volts. The ECU measures that voltage and converts those into real values, like temperature degrees, pressure PSI, or percentage throttle. For example, 0 volts might mean 0% throttle, and 5 volts might mean 100% throttle. Now there's also another type of input called an SPI, or a synchronized pulse input. Instead of reading a voltage between 0 and 5 volts, these instead read how fast a pin is pulsing high or low. And remember, high just means it has voltage, so 5 or 12 volts, and low means ground, or 0 volts. Now these SPI pins will read sensors like a vehicle speed sensor, which detects the teeth of a gear wheel going past the sensor, or flex fuel sensors which use a pulsed output rather than a 0 to 5 volt reading. So remember, reading a raw voltage like 0 to 5 volts means it's analog. If it's reading pulses, it's digital. We also have some knock sensor inputs, but those are very specialized inputs that can only be used for knock sensors. They cannot be repurposed. Now this part may be a bit confusing. There are a number of limitations on what pins you can use for what function, despite being pretty flexible. How do you know for sure that you can use that DBW1 pin to turn on your check engine light, for example? Well, you could go and simply assign it in the software. Remember, you don't need the ECU connected to make your tune. So before wiring any inputs or outputs physically, go and assign the functions that you plan to use in the software beforehand. For example, we can go and enable the check engine light feature and assign it a DBW pin. Then we can go and enable drive by wire and it'll tell us that the check engine light is using a wire that it requires. A wire it require, a wire it require, wire. The software prevents us from making mistakes. So, in general, what I'll do before doing any major wiring is, one, set up my tune with all the functions I need and assign the pins before doing any actual wiring, or two, just use a bass tune. The Haltech software comes with just a ton of bass tunes from many cars and many engines. So I select the bass tune that matches my engine and then modify it to suit my car. If there are any conflicts, the software will tell me before I ever even touch the wiring. When I'm happy with the tune, I'll click this button here to give me a wiring report so I know which pins to solder where. So this is the bass tune for the H6 that I swapped into my 99 Legacy, and it looks like they repurposed the Cylinder 7 ignition wire to turn on the check engine light. Which makes sense, as I'm only using 6 of the 8 ignition pins anyway. So I'll solder that up. It looks like the radiator fan should be wired to Step 1 P1, and the fuel pump relay should be wired to Step 1 P2. Those are all wires within the Haltech wiring diagram. So in other words, use the software to build your wiring adapter. Whether you use a base tune to guide you or you make it from scratch, do it all ahead of time in the software. This will avoid you having to rewire things down the road. And sure, use the Haltech diagram for basic things like power and grounds, but for real functions, you can't beat the actual tune that your car will actually run. And as a bonus, you can do all this wiring right at your desk. No crouching down in the car or hanging over the engine bay. That sucks. Okay, so thus far we've only wired things that relate to the body of the car, like a check engine light, a fuel pump, and a rad fan. What about the engine stuff? So the factory engine in this car connected to the ECU through the firewall, as that ECU lived in the floorboard. It went through these connectors here called the bulkhead connectors. The wires here end up on the other side of the firewall right at the ECU plugs. Now, in order for your engine to run, the ECU needs to know the rotational position the engine is in. How else would it know when to spark? Is the engine even at the right angle to spark? Is it even on the compression stroke? The ECU determines the engine position using two sensors, the cam and the crank sensor, or as Haltech calls them, the home and the trigger. A side note, not all engines are like this, but the ones I've worked with actually have been. The LS, the K-Series, the 4 and 6-cylinder Subaru engines all use just a cam and a crank sensor. You can use this as a base for your engine. Now, cam and crank sensors usually come in two flavors. A Hall Effect, or sometimes just called a Hall sensor, or a VR, or Variable Reluctance, or a Reluctor sensor. Now, how can you tell the difference between the two? A Hall Effect sensor has three wires, and a VR sensor has two. The Hall Effect sensor's three wires are power, usually 5 volt, ground, and signal. Check your wiring diagram for the pin order. 
The VR, on the other hand, has just two wires. It does not have a power or a ground, and both wires go right back to the ECU. One wire is called positive, the other is called negative, and it's important that you get those right when hooking them up to the Haltech. If you happen to swap them up, it's no big deal, it won't hurt the ECU or anything, the engine just won't run until you switch them back around. Now remember, just because these pins are called positive and negative, don't wire power to them, that'll fry the sensor. Both pins only go directly to the ECU as the Haltech wiring diagram indicates. Now the Haltech wiring diagram actually tells you how to wire each of these sensors to its special inputs. Now, how can we actually wire those to the ECU? You could pull the Haltech wires through the firewall right to the engine harness, or even right to the sensor, and splice them together there. That's totally okay and valid, however, we've got some nice wiring that the factory ECU used that we can hijack. The Factory 99 Legacy Crank Position Sensor was apparently a two-wire sensor, meaning it was probably a VR sensor. And it just so happens that the crank sensor on the H6 is also a two-wire VR sensor. My, how serendipitous. So, why not just run the new crank sensor through the same wires that the old one went through? They're already there. Remember those bulkhead connectors? Let's use those to our advantage. I personally try to reuse as much factory wiring as I can, and try to avoid running extra wires because that's extra work. Now we can check which pins the factory crank sensor went through on that bulkhead connector using the wiring diagram. And then see which pins they come out of on the ECU connector. So, does that mean we gotta cut the bulkhead connectors off the firewall harness and splice it in there? No, you barbarian! Go to your original factory engine and cut them off that engine harness. You're not gonna need that anyway, we're doing a swap! Then, splice into those connectors! Now, I got my H6 from a JDM importer and was lucky enough that they cut the bulkhead connector right off the firewall of the JDM donor car. Meaning, I can technically make a little patch harness that adapts from 99 Legacy to H6 engine. So what this is, is this is a patch harness from the original 99 Subaru Legacy over to the new one. And all the stuff that I did on the ECU connector, so between the Haltech and the ECU connector, is just plumbed out through here. So how I reused those injectors, I went ahead and rewired it to this connector that eventually goes through the throttle body. Now, it looks more complicated than it really is, but if we notice, there's some extra wires just like the Haltech had. These, of course, are for the injectors, these are for the coils, and these are for the VTEC. Pretty simple stuff. Now all that's left is for me to go put this out there, test it, and then I have to run all, what is that, 14 of these extra wires by hand, which isn't all that hard. They're all very easy to identify with those wiring diagrams and spreadsheets that I made earlier. Also, if you're missing those connectors, just go to the junkyard and snip them off one of their cars. So, right now you might be thinking, man, going through those bulkhead connectors seems pretty complicated. I'd probably rather go right from the Haltech to the engine instead of doing all that. And yeah, that's a fair assessment. But remember, that bulkhead connector has just about everything you need, especially switched power for your injectors, ignition coils, and solenoids. And yeah, it is more complicated. So I'm going to show you a little trick to make things much easier. Remember this handy pinout that we had for the Subaru ECU connector? Wouldn't it be nice if there were pinouts for those bulkhead connectors as well? Well, unfortunately, Subaru doesn't provide any, but it's really not that hard to make your own, and I'll show you how. So it looks like there's three bulkhead connectors, B20, B21, and B22. So what I'm going to do is make a new spreadsheet with three pages, one for each connector. I'll also put a little screenshot of the connector on each page as well. Now I'll go through each page of the engine wiring diagram and just write down what each pin, color, and purpose of the pin is. Okay, so it looks like pin 2 is our signal ground, the black wire. So I'll go ahead and label that. And it appears that pin five is our coolant temperature sensor signal, which is a black yellow wire. So label that. Pin six here, which is the knock sensor, and seven is its shield. So that is a blue white wire. And you get the gist. Basically, you go through each page, find the connectors, and write down what each pin does in your spreadsheet. And then you've created a pinout for all those connectors. Now give me a sec, I'm going to go through and do that. Alright, here we are a few minutes later. Here is 
B20, B21, and B22. Really didn't take that long to do. Now I also went ahead and did the couple of bulkhead connectors for the H6, which has this main big guy right here, along with all of his pins, and then this little guy right here. Now, this might all sound like quite a bit of work, but at the end of the day, not only are you helping yourself by making a bulkhead pinout, you're also taking a look at literally everything you need to wire on your engine. It's like making a list of things to do. And now that we have both pinouts, we can just kind of match things up. Like we have our two pin crank sensors right here. Well, I know that I can connect them to the two crank pins right here, reusing the factory harness. Then I just check what pins they come out of on the ECU connector and then wire the Haltech to that. So we can just kind of match things up. So we have our 12 volt injector power here. We can just kind of hook that up to our 12 volt injector power over here. Here's our coil 12 volt. Again, connected to the coil 12 volt. You just kind of match A to B. It's very easy. But this all starts to fall apart when we realize that the 99 legacy bulkhead connectors are meant for a four cylinder and the H6 bulkhead connectors are meant for a six cylinder, meaning we have two extra wires that have to be pulled through somewhere. So sure, you might be able to get some power, grounds, and sensors through the factory connectors, but eventually you'll still need to pull some external wires through for those additional cylinders. Six is greater than four, after all. So what I'll try to do is repurpose some of those bulkhead pins for other things, like the injectors. The legacy bulkhead connector only has four pins for four injectors. So to wire the H6, you could wire cylinders one through four through those and then pull two additional wires for the other two cylinders, but that just seems kind of dirty, having them separate like that. So what I did instead was wire all six injectors through the firewall externally and then repurpose those four injector wires for something else, such as my electronic throttle body. Now DBW throttle bodies need four wires going to the ECU. Two for the motors, two for the position sensors. So I just hijacked the injector pins for that. In fact, I made a little wiring diagram of what I repurposed in the factory harness so I know what to solder to the Haltech. And here's the mapping for the electronic throttle body. But by far the most useful pins from those bulkhead connectors are the power and ground pins. Even if you think the rest is too complicated, which I'd understand, at least use the bulkhead connectors for that. That way, if I blow an injector fuse, I know that the injectors were actually the problem. And things are still switched on by the key, as they should be. For whatever reason, people's first instinct is to, like, gut out all the wiring and install a custom fuse box or run two fuse boxes or something. Which is fine, if you're a Neanderthal. But I like my factory stuff to work. I like that my key switches stuff on and off. I like that my factory tachometer works. And I like my check engine light. So, now you know how I merge all three harnesses together. The ECU harness, the car harness, and the engine harness. Go forth and get everything pinned up how you prefer. It is your car after all, but try to keep things clean because remember, you gotta be the guy to work on this next. Now the last bits of info I have for you are just some notes about injectors and actuators and stuff. I'm just gonna rapid fire through these, so feel free to refer back to this as necessary. So, injectors. They're similar to the light bulb and the relay we looked at earlier. One side always has 12 volts, and the other side is grounded by the ECU whenever he wants to open the injector and squirt some fuel. They're low side switched. Now the same goes for most solenoids, like electronic boost control solenoids, EVAP solenoids, and even VTEC solenoids. Most are low side switched. Although the K-series did have one VTEC solenoid that was high side switched, I think. I don't know. Now ignition coils are a bit different. Most modern coil on plug setups have three pins. 12 volt, ground, and signal. The signal pin can be a bit confusing, but for newer coils, you just wire them right to the ECU's ignition pin, one per cylinder. Some other engines have coil packs, where they'll have a big block with ignition wires coming out of it that go to each cylinder. This 99 Legacy's original engine had that setup, and the coil pack had four wires, power, ground, signal one, and signal two. But wait a minute, it has four cylinders, that doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't it need four signal wires instead of two? Not quite. That's because that engine runs a wasted spark setup. Google that for more info or check Haltech's documentation. And with the older cars like the 99 Legacy, you couldn't just wire signal one and signal two right to the ignition pins. They had to go through an igniter or a coil driver first. If you tried to wire it directly, it could hurt your ECU. 
Again, research your ignition system and see how to wire it. Follow the factory wiring diagrams for more info. Also, coils tend to be very sensitive as to what settings are configured within the ECU. If you configure or wire them wrong, there's a chance you could fry the coil. And if you're not sure what those settings should be, you can try the following. Number one, ask your tuner. Number two, if you're raw dogging this, check a Haltech bass tune. Number three, if you can't find a bass tune, you can check an OEM tune. For example, I downloaded a stock 2009 Legacy 3.0R tune. Then I opened it in ECU Flash, which is the factory flash tuning software for Subarus. I copied the settings out of there right into the Haltech. As another example, for the LS that went into the RX-8, I downloaded a stock LQ4 tune, opened it in EFI Live, and copied the settings. Now if you can't do any of that, you could always try searching or asking in an online forum, but good luck with that. So shielded connections. Things like the cam and the crank and the knock sensors and the SPIs, they have shielding around them to help prevent electrical interference. Now those shields are grounded at the Haltech within the harness, so don't worry about grounding them anywhere else. In fact, if you did, you'd probably cause more problems than solve. If you're splicing two shielded connections together, try to join the two shields on the outside of the splice so long as the other side isn't already grounded. Sensor power. Most sensors are powered by 5 volts, such as pressure sensors and throttle position sensors. The Haltech has a dedicated 5 volt sensor pin for you to supply the sensors with that 5 volt power. You'll also notice that the Subaru ECU pinout has a sensor power supply pin as well. You'll want to plumb the Haltech 5 volt to that sensor power pin as it distributes 5 volts to necessary sensors on the engine and even some things in the gas tank if I remember right. Some sensors are powered with 12 volts though things like mass airflow sensors and flex fuel sensors. If you see a sensor powered by the fuse box, it's powered by 12 volts. If you see a sensor connected to the sensor power, it's a 5 volt sensor. When in doubt, check the wiring diagram or just look it up online. Now most sensors should be grounded to the signal ground. You'll find that the factory wiring harnesses already do that for you, so usually you just have to connect the signal ground wire from the Haltech to the signal ground wire on both the car harness and the engine harness. Now some other sensors are a bit weird. Factory Subaru mass airflow sensors, for example, are powered by 12 volts and have both a regular ground and a sensor ground. They also integrate the intake air temperature sensor in that same mass airflow unit. So check those diagrams. And throughout this video, you may have heard me say signal ground and sensor ground. They're the same thing, I just use them interchangeably. Now you're going to need a wideband O2 sensor, and there's two paths you can go with this. Now the cheap path is where you get a cheapo wideband gauge that has a 0 to 5 volt data logging pin coming out of the gauge. You can wire that to a regular Haltech AVI and use it as a wideband. But be warned, this is very susceptible to interference and gives a relatively dirty signal. However, it does work and I've done it on a number of builds, including the K-Swapped Subaru. Now the less cheap route is to get a real wideband kit from Haltech that communicates over CAN bus, which isn't susceptible to noise and gives a substantially cleaner signal. So pick your poison. The tachometer on most older cars is just a wire that pulses high and low over and over. The faster the pulse, the higher the RPM. Now Subarus are a bit weird in that they want a 12 volt pulse and only like one pin on the Haltech is capable of doing that. So make sure you enable that in the software and you figure out which pin that is to get things to work. Just another reason to do everything in the software beforehand. When I'm doing my wiring, I'll usually get the ECU power done and then wire up the cam and the crank sensors and then try to test crank the engine. The RPM readout on the laptop should go up. If it doesn't, the Haltech software has a wonderful readout of diagnostics information to help you figure out why it's not reading engine position, aka the trigger diagnostics. For example, when I first wired my H6, it wasn't reading the RPM and the trigger error count would increase with every revolution of the engine. Now this led me to believe that my crank sensor, which is a two-wire VR sensor, was wired wrong. It was clearly reading something because that trigger error count kept going up with every revolution, but whatever it was wasn't right. It turns out I just had the two pins swapped around. I fixed that and then it started reading RPM. In fact, the only things that need to be wired to make your engine run are the ECU power, the cam and the crank sensors, and the coils. That's it. You can spray some starter fluid in the throttle body and do a test fire to see if things are wired up properly. Bonus points if you do it at 2am without any headers. Just beware because that starter fluid really likes to backfire. Give a whirl. Diagnostic readouts like the trigger error counts are one of the reasons that I think standalones are easier to wire in than factory ECUs. 
they just give you so much information that's difficult or straight up impossible to get out of a factory ECU. So as you're wiring things up to the Haltech, check the software and make sure the sensors are reading good data. Like, the coolant temperature sensor should read ambient temperature. If it's not, something is probably wrong. Same with intake air temperature sensors and pressure sensors. Those should read ambient and zero PSI because the engine's not running. Don't be afraid of drive-by-wire electronic throttle bodies. Embrace them. They're not actually any laggier than cable throttle bodies. Let me say that again. Drive-by-wire isn't any laggier or slower than drive-by cable. The OEMs just tune them to be laggier to save on emissions. They're actually just as responsive as cable throttle bodies, and the default Haltech tune is for them to be responsive, which is what you want. Wiring is easier than trying to trim cables and make brackets, in my opinion. As a bonus, you don't have to deal with idle valves, and you can enable things like cruise control and rally-style anti-lag. Buttons and switches can be wired to both AVIs and SPIs. You'll probably need to enable a pull-up on the pin within the Haltech software, and only certain inputs support pull-ups, so again, get everything squared away in the software before you wire it. Things like clutch switches, rolling anti-lag buttons, and air conditioning buttons may need a pull-up to be enabled. If you're curious as to what a pull-up is, go ahead and Google pull-up resistor for more info. The Haltech software includes a manual that you can access by pressing F1 on your keyboard, and it is damn well written. Whoever wrote that deserves a bonus in a raise. If you don't know what something in the software means, chances are it's documented within the manual and it'll tell you exactly what it is. When in doubt, Google it. Their site has additional articles that are great as well. The two sensors I add, if not already present, are an oil pressure sensor and a fuel pressure sensor. You can enable engine protection in the Haltech and use those to trigger a failsafe mode if they drop below expected values. Imagine you're in the middle of a pole with 20 psi of boost and your fuel pressure drops. That ECU is going to react a lot faster than your foot will and will potentially save your engine. Plus, you can data log them and determine if your engine is starving for oil or if you need a fueling system upgrade. You can actually see me do just that in the video about the RX-8, so go watch that if you haven't yet. Now, speaking of sensors, most sensors that standalone manufacturers sell are actually just white-labeled OEM sensors, including the ones Haltech sells. So here's a flex fuel sensor from Haltech, and here's one on Amazon. <laughs> Golly, these two sure do look similar, and that's because they're probably the same. You can buy both the sensor and the plug on Amazon for less than half the price that Haltech charges. This is how I get all of my sensors for what it's worth. Now speaking of flex fuel, if you're worried about blowing up your engine because you don't know how to tune ignition timing or something, just run E85. That stuff is practically race fuel with its 107 octane. So you really gotta mess up to make it knock. I have done unholy things on E85 and gotten away with it. Also, you don't need a flex fuel sensor to run E85. Flex fuel sensors are just to tell the ECU if you have a mix of regular gasoline and E85. But if you're running a full tank of corn, you can just go into the ECU here, change this to ethanol petrol blend mode, and then set the actual ethanol content manually. If you're wondering what that percentage should be, you can get one of these cheapo test kits to test the actual ethanol content for your area. So long as you're running a full tank of E85, this should work just fine. There's a couple things to be aware of though. Just because it's E85 doesn't mean it's 85% ethanol content. The max I've ever seen in my area is about 70%, which is still good. Also, they have what's called a winter blend, which means as the winter season arrives, the ethanol content percentage actually goes down to help vehicles start and run in the winter. You just have to make sure that your fuel system is ethanol compatible and that your fuel system and injectors can supply the required fuel for E85. Remember, E85 takes an additional 30% fuel by volume to be stoic. Look into that more if you're curious. You may be swapping into a newer car that relies on a CAN bus to control various modules throughout the car. Things like the dash cluster, electric power steering, or the steering wheel buttons. My RX-8 is this way. Now the Haltech actually supports RX-8 CAN bus emulation, meaning it can pretend to be the factory RX-8 ECU on the CAN bus to make those things work. So I was able to wire it into the car's CAN bus, turn that on, and now that stuff just works. Check your ECU's list of supported CAN bus profiles and see if your car is in the list. If it doesn't, you may be able to replace your car's dash cluster with an aftermarket cluster, like this LCD screen made by Haltech. As for the other ancillary components, beyond the programming of a custom CAN bus translator, you may not have many options. CAN bus is a separate video on its own, but just know that it can be a major hurdle in some swaps. 
Take time to research what would be crippled by you removing your factory ECU, especially if your standalone doesn't support emulating it. Expensive standalones are not the only option to go with. Again, I've been using the Haltech as an example in this video, but there are other options. The first cheaper alternative that might come to mind is a Mega Squirt, but I only find these to be just slightly cheaper than their more refined competitors like Haltech and Link. A couple of actually cheap options I can think of are Speedwino and Rust EFI. If you're looking to save cash, you can look into those, but beware that they require a lot more DIY knowledge than your traditional standalone. Okay, now I'm going to go over some tools and consumables I use when I do my wiring. Links to each thing will be below if I can find them. So when you go to wire things, you may be questioning how you actually splice the wires together. Now this is a pretty hot debate in the wiring fandom, but when in doubt, follow these simple rules. Crimp in the engine bay, solder in the cabin. Or crimp in the cabin, or do whatever in the cabin, who cares? We're mostly worried about the heat in the engine bay affecting those soldered joints. Now, with that being said, I have neglected that advice before and even soldered every connection together under the hood of the RX-8, which gets just incredibly hot under there. Haven't had any issues yet. Also, if you're using these style of crimp connectors, put down the crimpers, step away from the wiring, because these are hot garbage. Instead, I use these non-insulated butt connectors along with their special crimper. Then I'll put heat shrink over that. It saves you a ton of space in your wiring loom. I've also been playing with these low temp solder heat shrink connectors. When you hit them with heat, the solder melts and fuses the wire together. I've used them for in-cabin wiring and even some exterior lighting because they're weather tight, but I wouldn't suggest them under the hood because low temp solder and all. But I've done it a few times and it's been fine. Shh. I keep three sizes of heat shrink on hand for both my soldered connections and crimped connections. The sizes are 3 32nds, 1 8 and 3 16 inch. I also have a little kit of assorted sizes for the oddball joint that needs something weird. I use this little portable soldering iron to do my in-car wiring. It's powered by an RC car battery, so I can use it to get into tight places. While I try to do most of my soldering at my desk with a real soldering station, this is nice for when I'm doing stuff in the car. Also, make sure you're using the right solder. Don't get that mega big crap for soldering copper pipe together or anything. Get real solder. I use .032 inch in diameter. By the way, this ribbed stuff that they put over the wiring in cars is called split wiring loom. I have three sizes of that here as well, but I bought them so long ago I can't remember the sizes. These automatic wire strippers are great. Now some people say they wear out fast, but I have a little secret to making them last forever. Just don't use them on big wire. Especially, don't strip residential wiring with it. It makes them wear out really fast. I've had these for like seven years and they're still like new. This is the multimeter I use. It's cheap and it has Bluetooth built in so you can monitor it from your phone to see what the meter is reading without actually being near the meter. I also keep a handful of these cheapo meters around just in case. A friend gave me this little torch that I use for heat shrink. And they're normally used for making food, like creme brulee, but you can use it to make shit boxes as well. I think that's all I got for you on wiring right now. Now, one thing to note is that this video uses a Subaru to Subaru swap as an example, but that does not matter. That is literally the same as swapping an LS into an RX-8. For both swaps, I still had to merge the three harnesses together. Sure, there's some little quirks about each different car and engine, but there's nothing crazy. What you end up realizing as you get deeper into this is that nobody's doing anything special. All engines are borderline identical. And sure, some might have four cylinders, another might have eight, but that doesn't matter. It's just two wires per cylinder. One for the coil, one for the injector. And yeah, your engine might have VTEC, bro. But that's literally one wire to a solenoid. Even the rotaries are real similar to normal engines, despite having two spark plugs and injectors per rotor. Now, more modern cars might be a pain with CAN bus, but at most, you're just not going to get some comfort features like the dash cluster or power steering. But the engine will still run, and the car will still drive. No matter what, once you get this under your belt, you can wire practically anything out there. Now remember, this is just how I wire things. I'm not a professional working for a race team or anything. I'm just a dude out here trying to have a good time. There's about a million ways to go about wiring a swap, and this is just one of them. So do your research and figure out what works best for you. Hopefully this has given you some insight on how I do things. I know this is a lot of info to be dumped at once, but ideally you'll be better equipped to wire your swap now. Now, if you've made it this far, 
go ahead and look at how long this video is. This took an excessively long time to write, film, and edit. And you made it to the end. Now, like the video and subscribe. You owe me. You should be seeing some stuff about some of the other projects I've been working on here real soon. I've got some cool videos planned that I'm real excited to get out there, so stay tuned. But until then, bye for now.